Welcome, guys. Today we're going to be talking about land trusts and their appropriate uses, especially in real estate. We're going to demystify it, break it down into its little pieces, give you guys a bunch of examples on how they're used and who uses them and why and when they're appropriate and how they work together with an LLC. So we're just going to jump right in. Before we do that, I do want to ask you guys, if you could, click that like button and the subscribe button. It helps with the analytics and gets the message out and also lets me know what you guys actually like. I'll bribe you with a picture of one of my cats. Boom. There we go. All right, let's jump in. Uh, I'm going to share out a screen and put myself up in the corner so you can kind of see it. And we're just going to be talking about land trusts in general. But I do like to kind of draw out who the players are. I'm going to start right away with kind of the three three main players. Uh, so there's something called a grantor, a trustee, and a beneficiary. Anytime you have a trust, you have these players. There's always three of them. The grantor in some circles is called the settlor, that's who's creating the document, putting in the asset. So in a land trust, this is usually the party who's contributing the real estate. The trustee is whose name is on title. And so when you're dealing with a land trust, it's nothing more than an agreement between these three parties. It's a paper agreement. There's no repository for it. The only way somebody even knows it exists is because there's a, a name on a on a title somewhere. So if you go into a county record, you might see, hey, here's so-and-so trustee of the such-and-such -such trust, right? This is no different than a living trust, by the way. They're both grantor trusts, they're both revocable. The land trust is just there to hold real estate. I'm getting way ahead of myself. The trustee is whose name, and this is really just going on title on a property. And I want you just to really think about that for a second. This is just the person who's out there or entity who's out there to hold title. They're the disclosed party to hold title. Like if I go buy a house and I'm buying it and putting my name, unless I create a trust, in which case now I have a trust, but the trust name isn't sufficient. We always have to have a trustee. So it's kind of like having little kids. The kid can't own anything. They don't, they're not age of majority yet. So you always have a parent who's holding it for them, right? In a trust, it's similar. The beneficiary's name is nowhere. The beneficiary gets to do things like rent the property, collect the rents, sell, all this good stuff. All the benefits, occupy, all that stuff is with the beneficiary. The only thing the trustee gets to do is put their name on title. They're just acting on behalf of the trust. Grantor is the one who creates it. And by the way, grantor could go through and revoke it, can change it, do whatever they want with it. Like the grantor is in a really good spot because, or during their lifetime, I'll just say that, because it's a revocable instrument. You're entering into an agreement that you could change at any time. And so hopefully some light bulbs just clicked off. Like some of you guys are starting to figure this out. Wait a second. So it's really just to hold title. Yes. Is there any asset protection over here? Does the beneficiary get any asset protection? Not when it's revocable. Zero. Zilch. That beneficiary is fully exposed as though they own that property. They have all the liability that goes along with it. What about the trustee? No, nope, trustees aren't. They're, 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 they're only a liability they could have is perhaps to the beneficiary. Trustees don't have any liability here. Trustees just putting their name on it. But in both those cases, guess what we do? We still want to avoid any possible negative stuff that could go on with a disclosure of that trustee on title and also any liabilities that could occur by having a beneficial interest in that property. Grantor, not worried about. We're not really worried about them. We're just gonna say, hey, don't even worry about the grantor. We'll just take them out of the equation what we really care about is the two parties that have interaction with the public. So the trustee, it, their name is on title. So we use an LLC for that because we don't want your name disclosed. So we like to use an anonymous 
LLC for that. So we would use a Wyoming LLC for the trustee position. And before you completely lose your mind, yes, this is legal. And in Wyoming, we don't have to disclose a party. So you literally can, you, you can have anonymous ownership. And again, I always get these people like, you can't do that. What if, what if their law says you, you can't? What law? Right? This is common law. There's about maybe 15 states that have statutes and none of them have restrictions like that. The beneficiary could enforce it. If, if, if you, hey, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to have a natural person. Okay. If there is that situation, whose right of enforcement is it? Sitting over here with this beneficiary. You're going to sue yourself? Kind of doubt it. So what you do is you use that LLC without a name attached to it. So it's anonymous LLC. I call it security through obscurity. If they can't see it, if they don't know you're involved, they're not going to sue you for it. Right? So, and, and this works in reverse. If somebody can't find all the assets you have, and let's say that, hey, let's say you get into the car accident and you hit a stockbroker, right? Stockbroker's rich and uh, they're going to sue you for three or four million bucks, right? You just want to, you want to end the nonsense. Hey, come on, that's not a legitimate claim. Come on, you're, you're getting crazy. Maybe you hurt them. But still, they're inflating the value, or they think they could get that. And they go to the lawyer, lawyer's looking for a contingency fee, and they see a automobile insurance policy. Let's say it's 500 grand. That's what they're looking at. They're going to maybe do a profile on you. They're going to get, get their buddy, the PI, to do a profile on you and see what assets you hold. If you're using a land trust, guess what is not showing up on your asset search, any real estate that you have. What about your house? Could we make your house disappear? Yeah, we actually could. Oh, but they might see a mortgage if they know about the property. I mean, they know you probably have a home, but let's say they figure that out. The rest of it is your investment properties. Like this is rich people stuff, right? Where they say, hey, you know, you got 10 rentals. The last thing you'd wanna do is tell everybody, by the way, here's my 10 rentals. Here's how much equity is in them. We don't want to voluntarily give that out to somebody because they may use it full to try to hurt us. And so in this particular case, let's say that you got into a car accident. It's somebody who think that they could inflate the value of the claim because they could say, hey, you hurt somebody who's a real high income producing individual and now they're restricted. Maybe they won't be able to work the same. Whatever the case, you have this large liability looming only if they have assets that they can collect against. They take a look. They don't see a bunch of assets, so the attorney who's trying to do the best by his client says, you know what, let's settle for the insurance proceeds because that's a burden to hand. We don't want to wait three or four years to go through a whole bunch of lawsuit and a lot of added expense. You're going to have to hire all these experts. It's going to be tens of thousands of dollars, if not hundreds. And I don't want to work that hard for my, for my 30% or 40%, whatever the cut is. And it's uncertain whether we'll even be able to collect a, you know, we really need to just settle this thing right now. That's 99% of the cases, by the way, is you're just trying to get it into a settlement posture. If they can't see everything you have, you're much more likely to get into that settlement posture. And that's what we're doing here. By the way, what actually shows up on title? So I'm just going to give you guys an example. Let's say that we put 123 Main Street into, we have a piece of real estate and we put that into the trust. How do you put it into trust, by the way? Like, is this filed with the state? No, you're actually putting it in via a deed. So a lot of times it's a warranty deed. Uh, some states, it might be a quick claim deed, but let's just say we're putting it in a warranty deed and all we're doing is changing the title. And I like to use the actual address in the name of the trust. So I might call the trust, the 123 Main Street Trust. And then it's going to be by its trustee. And let's just say this LLC up here is called ABC LLC. By its, its trustee, ABC LLC. So what ends up on title? I'll show you exactly what ends up on title. What ends up on title is the 123 Main Street Trust 
dated. I like to put the date in there so it define, you know, separates it from any other Main Street Trust, the 123 Main Street Trust. But let's just say it's January 1st of, you know, 20XX, whatever it is. Whatever date you actually sign it. So whatever, you know, so hopefully you're not signing things on New Year's. But let's just say you did. So 123 Main Street Trust dated such and such by its trustee. And I just put it A, B, C, L, L, C. That's literally how that thing's going to be titled. Notice what's not on there. You or your LLC. So remember how I said we still want to protect the beneficial interest. We're going to put that into an LLC as well. So we're going to have two LLCs. One that is a, you know, again, you're not doing this necessarily on one property. Hopefully you have multiple properties that you're putting this into. You might do this on a situation like for your house where you don't want people to be able to find out where you live, depending on what your profession is. Like if you're a doctor, especially a psychiatrist or a therapist or somebody dealing with some folks that you may not want to know where you live or you know, law enforcement already has this, but let's just say you wanna be a little extra careful. You don't want people to know where you are or you're somebody who's wealthy or you have family that annoys you or you've been the victim of abuse. So you wanna make sure that nobody can figure out where you live. You could do this easily, even with your home. And again, some people's heads explode when you say, by the way, you can literally keep your name off of title. Your name does not appear anywhere. We just did this. That's exactly what would be untitled. Period. Full stop. Well, I, what about that L ABC LLC in Wyoming? You don't have anybody listed. Well, the Main Street Trust that you got, surely you have to file it with the Secretary of State. No, you don't. It's simply a trust agreement signed by the three parties. You remember our grantor, our trustee, and our beneficiary. And then we take the beneficial interest and we assign it to an LLC. The reason we do that is because if a liability occurrence occurs, it's stuck inside the LLC. If you have a fire, somebody falls down the steps, whatever, it's stuck inside this LLC. Nobody sees that LLC. We just assign it to the LLC, but it is not on title. In other words, when I look up 123 Main Street, I do not see the LLC that's holding the beneficial interest on title. It's not listed. It's not in a public record. It's not sitting there available for somebody to look at. Guys, this is so effective, especially for people that don't want to have an LLC for every single property they have. If you're somebody who really likes to invest in real estate like me, and you're buying lots and lots of properties, sometimes you don't want to, especially in a particular state, you may say, you know what, I don't want to have an LLC for each property. It's too expensive to maintain. Maybe your state is like my state where it's 400 bucks a year or 800 bucks a year, whatever it might be. You may say, you know what, I wanna have three or four properties in an LLC and here's a way that you can keep anybody from knowing that your LLC has three properties in it. You use three land trusts. There's no filing fee for it. The only thing you have to worry about is the deed transfer. Depending on your state, it could be 10 bucks. It could be 25 bucks, 50 bucks. I don't even know if there's any that are really much more than that. It's pretty inexpensive to do a deed transfer. And I'll get into some other savings that occur too. Like for example, if you are in Florida and you're putting a property directly into an LLC, you have to pay dock stamp fees for the, the, the value of any mortgages on it. You actually have to pay a transfer tax. All right, that stinks. You don't have to do that if it's a land trust. Or in Nevada, where I'm in Clark County right now, and you could put a property in an LLC, but if you transfer it out of the name of the LLC, like let's say you're doing a refi or something like that, and you put it back in your name to do the refi or just take it out and you're going to put it into a different LLC, you have to pay a transfer tax. So we can avoid that by using a land trust. And so both those situations, and there's lots of them all around the country, there's the land trust avoids any nonsense that might hit us. But again, getting ahead of myself, I want to make sure that we're nailing this point down really, really hard. This guy right here, the name on the actual deed is all that's a public record. 
If somebody searches you, your name does not show up associated with this property. If they dig into you, if they know the existence of the property, they may be able to dig into it. Or if you have a mortgage on it, sometimes they can try to search via a mortgage document. But when they're looking to see what do you own, I am doing an asset search to see what you own. It's not showing up. Are you in chain of title somewhere if you used to own this thing? Yes, but that is a much deeper dive. If somebody already knows about the property, then they'll look at it. But if I am just doing a plain vanilla asset search on somebody like I would if I was if I was contemplating being a, a plaintiff in an action or representing the plaintiff in an action, if I'm the attorney and I'm doing a, you know, not a five, six, ten thousand dollar asset search, but I'm doing a the regular asset search, you know, paying a few hundred bucks to a PI, they're not seeing this. They're not seeing it at all. Doesn't show up. Boom, gone. That's the power of this. Second power of this, you can have as many land trusts as you want. You're not dealing with a whole bunch of filing fees. It's not expensive. Uh, and I can keep a different name on each property. So if I have five LLCs that own a total of 25 properties, so there's five properties or uh, per LLC, it you cannot see which LLC owns which property or holds the beneficial interest of which property. With a land trust, the name on each property is unique. In other words, there's nobody that owns 25 properties. They can't see who has five of them, which five at all. It's all in your file cabinet, which can be pulled out at the opportune time if somebody comes a knocking. That's why these things are so effective. Third superpower of that, of that land trust do on sale clauses. So this land trust, as I said earlier, and I'm just gonna make sure that it's very, very clear, it's revocable and it's called an inter vivos trust. Living. You ever heard of a living trust? It's the same type of trust. Neither one of them, uh, neither a living trust or a land trust files a tax return. It's going it, to, they're called grantor trusts. So if we transfer the beneficial interest to an LLC, depending on that LLC files a tax return, but never the land trust itself. Same thing as if I have a living trust, I may file a personal 1040. I'm married. So my wife and I file a 1040, but the living trust does not file a separate trust or a separate tax return until it becomes irrevocable. It's revocable during my lifetime. When I pass away, it becomes irrevocable. Same thing with the land trust. These are no different. Due on sale clauses do not work against a living trust. Do not work against a land trust by default. You're always looking at it. You look at the Garden St. Germain Act. It's, it's four or less units. If you're using it as a as as a as a residence, primary residence, no bank can call a due on sale, period. But when you have a land trust, immediately the banks look at it in the same vein. It's a revocable trust, and you could actually show them the revocable trust. You could even show it to where they see that you're the beneficiary. You could assign your beneficial interest. At that point, I would not be showing that to any bank. I'm going to keep their life very easy. I'm going to show them a the certification of trust where it has me as the grantor, there's the name of the trust, and they know that it's me. We've never had a due on sale on a land trust trigger, and we've done tens of thousands. Uh, LLCs, it's seldom. You appear, Every now and again, you get a bank squawking about a transfer into an LLC, but it's still very seldom. But with a land trust, we don't have to worry. Depending on your state, you don't have to worry about transfer taxes. Depending on your state, you can avoid things like dock stamp fees. So land trusts are very, very effective there. Fourth superpower. If you're amassing some real estate together, you can have different ownership groups approaching different um, parcels. In other words, I could have, because I can change the name on this and I could have different trustees, I could even hire, like it doesn't have to be an LLC that's your trustee. You could have a trusted advisor 
I'd probably stay away from people in your own state, especially relatives that have your last name. I might be looking for somebody that has a different last name out of my state, but again, you're, you're kind of pushing a lot of faith on that individual. Maybe an attorney, maybe a maybe a fiduciary, somebody that that owes you a fiduciary duty. You could hire and put in that place. I know that my partner Clint likes to do the the trustee work on a lot of them, and so his name's showing up as the trustee. But you could have different trustees going in and putting offers on on, on properties, so somebody does not realize you are accumulating the property, maybe for a project, maybe because you're going to build a multifamily, maybe it's storage, maybe you're just getting land, maybe you're doing a, a manufactured housing park, whatever. What it's occurred over time is this happened for Disney World and this also happened for the Sears Tower where there were huge groups of, like they were buying tons of property and if they had had holdouts, it would have been very, very pricey. You get to the end there's, you know, the last few people that haven't sold their lots and they're, they're, they're charging you a king's ransom on it, right? You want to avoid that or you don't want people knowing that it's you accumulating properties. This is another way you go. If you don't want your tenants knowing that you owe, own a whole bunch of properties, you can always say, I work with the management. And if they ever look, the nosy tenant and they're going and they're, they're Googling and seeing who owns their property and they're seeing what else do they own. And they don't see like, hey, one, two, three Main Street, Main Street Trust. Okay, that's it. What else does 123 Main Street Trust own? Oh, nothing. Okay, so they're not seeing you and they're not seeing that you have 20 properties in town, right? You want to just be able to keep that stuff to yourself. Fifth superpower is you can switch out that beneficiary. You can move that property as, as needed, depending on how your asset protection needs change. So those are all very, very effective. Sixth superpower of a land trust really has to do with your home. This is a great use of it, is getting your name off of your personal residence if you don't want people to to, uh, to track you. Um, that's a huge one, is being able to actually affect your home without affecting your homestead, without doing a due on sale, out triggering any additional taxes, all those things you don't have to worry about when you're doing a land trust, because again, it's still a living trust. It's still an inter vivos trust. It's still revocable. It's easy to change. And because of that, we don't have any of the, any, any, any negative uh, consequences, tax or losing again, uh, like you still get your 121 exclusion, which is the capital gain exclusion. You still have your homesteads. You still have all these great things when you're using that land trust because of the type of trust it is. It's just, it's again, it's a great tool for holding title. It does not, the land trust itself, in any state except for Florida, I should say, the land trust itself does not create asset protection. The land trust itself, just the trust, the grantor with the trustee and the beneficiary, no asset protection. You really have to add that next layer on, you know, putting in that LLC into that document. Then you have asset protection. It's the same as it being in the LLC, which is so powerful. You've isolated the liability. You've isolated uh, not just the property from you, but also you from the property. Again, you get into a car accident and you hit the stockbroker, the Mr. Richie Rich or whatever, and they're coming after you, you can still have this asset protection put in place. And if you follow our other videos, you know that we're big proponents of having a Wyoming, Wyoming holding entity for your real estate. They won't be able to take it from you. They'll never be able to force the sale of the property if they're coming from the outside. On the inside, we can isolate that liability so if somebody falls down the stairs and they sue you for a million bucks or whatever, you, they have mold and they sue you for a million bucks or whatever the case, they make allegations against you on a piece of property for way more, way more than the property is worth. You could just hand them over. Hey, this, by the way, is, is out of my name. This is the uh, beneficiary. This is the most you can get. And by the way, it's the equity in the property that's at risk. So if you have encumbrances on your houses, even if it's liens with related entities, they still affect. They're, they're, they're still effective and the party coming after the asset is looking for the equity after the foreclosure sale. So like these are super, super effective. But the last thing that I wanna talk about with the land trust 
and uh, and I'll get you off of this big screen. Whoops, there we go. Um, and I'll just tell you from personal experience. When I go out and I'm putting offers on properties, uh, which I used to do in mass, like here in Vegas, it was really active 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, right, or, right after we had this big recession, some people called it a depression, but we had massive losses of, of property values. And we were putting in some days, 20 offers on properties. It is really tough if you think you're going to put an LLC together per property. A lot of people will do something like a AT Mathis and or assigns, you know, and then they'll set up an LLC. If you want to avoid all that, I would just use the same naming convention. My partner and I, Clint, we used to buy these things and I would just use the, the name of the street. So sometimes I use the address and the name of the street. So again, if it was one, two, three Main Street Trust, I may just call it Main Street Trust. And I might, you know, number them, you know, one, two, three, four, five, whatever, if there's multiple properties. Or I use the one, two, three Main Street Trust. And I just put in offers on properties in that name. I already know exactly how it's going to be named. It's going to be the the street uh, number, name, trust, dated by trustee, right? And so I just use that same convention every time I put an offer in. And if it's accepted, great. I create the document. I sign the document. Same day, I'm probably closing. I'm literally like, you know, and I'll probably take title in directly in the name of the trust. I wouldn't even have to come to me first. My name will never been associated with that property. This is also very effective for you wholesalers out there who sometimes you get caught with a property sitting in an entity and you're like, gosh, darn it. Or you end up closing on a property and you don't want your name on it. And here you just closed and you're hoping that you're going to sell it. Maybe you're trying to do a double close and something bad happens and you're not able to do it. If you just did it in the name of the trust, you don't have to worry about doing that, you know, having to close twice or any of that. You can literally just put your, hey, I'm just going to use the, I'll use the Main Street Trust as an example. I put my offer in as the 123 Main Street Trust and that's it. I get accepted. Who's the party who's had their offer accepted? It's the 123 Main Street Trust. The beneficial interest is what everybody wants. I go shop that around to my investors. Somebody pays me they get the 123 Main Street Trust. Sometimes I'm on there as a trustee and I'll just switch the trustee. Nobody really cares about that. What they care about is who's the offer or you know, who's making the offer on the property. So for wholesalers, these trusts are a you know, godsend. A lot of times wholesalers are playing the game of setting up multiple LLCs and they're trying to figure out where they should be putting their offers and that LLC exists. You know, so maybe they did a whole bunch of wholesaling and they use the same exact LLC and they get sued for something that occurred three years ago and boom, now they have liability where they're doing business and it sucks. So this is another great way of making sure that each property has separateness. So it's, it's in the trust name. Hey, I didn't do any transfers. It was never in my LLC. All I did is, 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 you know, go out and bring in another, somebody pay, basically pay me off as the, uh, to become the beneficiary. So much simpler to do things that way. Easy peasy. All right. So what did we hit on? A settler, grantor, the beneficiary, your main parties. Technically, there's something called the corpus of the trust, which is the asset. Where's the body of the trust? It's the piece of property that's in there. There's a trust agreement. And uh, and we can take the beneficial interest and we can put it in an LLC. The trustee can be an LLC. And we have basically a document that goes in my file cabinet. Some people will hear this. Land trusts are not legal in my state. Absolutely 100% fault. All, all 50 states recognize trust the same way as, you know, but they say, well, there's not a statute on it. Okay, there's multiple states. The minority have a statute. But that doesn't mean that it's illegal. It means that it's under common law. The same way as if I want to wear green shoes, there might not be a law prohibiting it, right? It doesn't mean that it's illegal if, if there's not a, a, a statute that says you can wear green shoes, right? If, if, if there was ever a statute that says, hey, you're allowed to wear green shoes, therefore you can, right? That's not how it works. Unless there's a statute that says you can't do something, then you can do it. 
land trust, living trust. They work in all 50 states. It's nice to work under a state that has a statute, but it's not necessary. Any state you can use this in. In fact, there's certain advantages to just using the common law because it's strictly court-based, strictly contract-based, makes life so easy. You're not paying a state for anything. You're not doing any of that nonsense. I'm not asking for permission on anything. I'm literally just doing it. And then I'm, I'm, I'm making sure that title is not in my name. That's where these things really start to shine. They work well in an asset protection plan where they, they, where you have another LLC. Now, again, conservative people like a property per LLC, but it's not necessarily recommended when you start getting into a lot of properties. What do I mean by a lot of properties? I would say more than 10, right? Once you get above a certain threshold and you have a certain amount of net worth, you're not too worried about losing a property. You, you know, you might be okay saying, hey, you know what, if I, if I lost five, it wouldn't matter. It's usually about 20% of your asset base where you're not going to sit there and cry if, it, if, if you lost it. So you divide everything up. So if you have 100 properties, you may have an LLC that has 10 to 20 properties in it. And this is a great way of making sure nobody goes in to that LLC and starts digging at it because they can see there's 10 properties in it. This way they would never see the LLC in the first place and they don't, and, and each, each property has a separate name on it so you don't see a whole bunch of names in the same LLC. For some of you guys, uh, I bet you that that's the first time you're hearing that. And this is an easy way to make sure that you can unring that bell, make sure it's not sitting there in the name of an LLC. So that's it. We really get down to this whole idea of common law versus statutory law. All states allow the living trust. All states allow in Revo's trust. All states allow revocable trust. That's all this is. It's an agreement, which means the agreement is what is critical here. And you're putting a trustee on deed. That's it. You have those basic things. You've got a very viable land trust that works like it, it's really, really inexpensive and effective. You learn how to use these things, you're gonna save yourselves a lot of headache. You're not dealing and waiting for states to give approval on certain documents like, oh, I have to close and I need my LLC and your know, state might take six weeks and you're dry, you're sweating bullets and you're worried and you got these people saying, take title right now, you know, blah, 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 blah. I could set up a land trust very simply, close and it, be done. It takes me all of about 15 minutes to put it together, sign it, get it there. Boom, I can take title. My name's not on it, so I don't have to worry about it. It's great. And it works like a charm. Wholesalers, this is another tool you want in your toolbox. Buy and holders, this is a great tool in your toolbox, especially in certain states where there's transfer taxes and things like that. That could be triggered if you're putting it in an LLC directly. This is another very, very effective tool that all real estate investors should be aware of uh, because it's so applicable, especially for the you guys who like doing the buy and holds like me. This is a great vehicle to allow reassignment of your portfolio without having to go out and do a whole bunch of deed changes and this, that, and the other. And it allows you to kind of unring the bell sometimes when little mistakes are made and keep your, keep your uh, asset protection plan very clean and private, which unfortunately this day and age, it's hard to do but it's probably the most effective asset protection plan. I'm not seeing too many homeless folks getting sued. So I kind of look at it saying there's a reason. It's not because they don't do anything. It's because nobody thinks they can get anything out of them for the most part. And, uh, you know, again, it, if there's a way to kind of look, hey, not wealthy on paper, this would be a good way. You don't want to attract the lawsuit. This is a very effective way because uh, I don't want you guys to look like a homeless person, right? But on paper, you you, you definitely want to look like you don't have a ton of assets. If somebody's sniffing around thinking, does this, does this person here look like they'd be a good defendant and have lots of assets for me to take? If we're able to prevail, you want the answer to be a resounding no. And one of the most effective ways is this obscurity or uh, security through obscurity is making sure that they can't see everything you have and there's always that big question mark. And in a lawsuit, that question mark is in your favor. If they don't know what you have, it devalues the settlement, which is in your favor to force things to settle. 
if there is a liability occurrence and you don't attract frivolous lawsuits and things like that, where somebody thinks, hey, this person's really going to have something created. So again, fast, easy, effective land trusts are a invaluable tool in so many asset protection plans, yet they sit around, not, people don't know what they are, they don't know how to use it. And if they're not up on it, they're oftentimes down on it. And they'll be like, oh, I don't know what that is. You know, it's illegal or whatever. They just don't want to learn it. Super easy to learn. In fact, share this video with them. And if you want more videos like this, put down in the comments what you're looking for. And uh, hopefully you're able to use this information to help yourself. Happy investing.